For this next project, we are going to be creating a webcam that allows us to then manipulate additional layers with the image and then download it as a file. So it will look something like this. I can click on take a photo, it takes a photo. Now you'll notice the photo flipped because I have the image as it's displayed inside the webcam mirroring so that it makes more sense when you hold up your hand or turn your head, it's turning in the way that you expect. Now when I click on start mixing, it will see that uh, it gives me this little kit, kitty picture. We'll just push that to the side. I don't really need that or I can just leave it over here because cats are nice. Now if I click on the horns, you'll see that I can now add horns into the picture. If I click on the glasses, I can bring up the glasses size those until they fit, can rotate them a little bit, can add in some lips, scale those down a little bit, rotate the lips so they fit the tilt of the head, and now that I have this done, I can save that image. It downloads the image to my computer. Now you'll notice that we have a checkered background here the image has been downloaded. It's downloaded as a PNG. The file name is called My Image and it's appended it with the date and time. And we can see now how it does have transparent edges on it. So it has transparency as part of the image. Thus, that's why we see the checkerboard pattern inside our webcam view. Again, this project we are going to jump over and look at the HTML, the CSS a little bit, and then more importantly, go into the JavaScript. Examining the HTML, standard document. And as I work my way through, we can see that it's loading a library. This library, the fabric library that it's loading, allows us to be able to have the objects sitting on the canvas and manipulate them, move them around, resize them, rotate them, adjust their stacking order, and that's all using just some of the really foundational or fundamental parts of the Fabric JavaScript library. As I work my way down, I will see I have two sections on my document. I have my camera content area. And then I have my canvas mix area. Now when I look through these, we have an H1, I have the paragraph that came up at the top, and then I have a div that represents my camera section. I'm going to have a canvas. Now this particular canvas here, the photo canvas, has an interesting feature assigned to it. So if I go and look in my CSS, I will see that its display is set to none. Because what we are doing behind the scenes is we are taking a picture, we're writing that information to this canvas object, but we never see it. So we use it as an off-screen canvas. And then we will use JavaScript to take the information on that canvas and convert it or save it into an actual PNG image file, which is what we put here inside this image. So then we set that as the source for this image file. Once we have that image file source established, we'll be able to click on this button. Clicking on that button will then make this first section go away. It will pull out the second section. And then when we're looking at the second section, we're going to then see that I have my canvas for mixing. I have three images that I'm working with, the lips, the glasses, and the horns. And then I have my download button, and I have my return button. So I have these two buttons. Now, If I look at the download button, the download button's a little bit different. It is an anchor tag. It has a download attribute and an href attribute. So we'll be taking a look at how all of that works as we start working on the JavaScript. With the JavaScript turned off, we'll see that the camera is not working. It's also not populating this box area here, so that's a pretty good indicator my JavaScript is not working. 
as always, I should always keep the console up while I'm working. I should use that as a way to study what is happening inside my document. And then down here, the checkerboard is the background for the canvas mix area. And then I have those images and two buttons down at the bottom. So within this canvas area, we can see this has an ID of C. So we go and wander into the canvas with an ID of C. We see it's using the background image of checker. So the images that we are using in our project, uh, we're using the checker, which is this background that represents the transparent background. So we know that it's transparent. We're using the glasses, the horns, and the lips. So we're using these as stickers or affectations that we're putting on to our main image. Other than that, there's nothing fancy or exciting going on in the CSS. Now, as we look through the CSS, what we will want to pay attention to is the fact that this page is fairly ugly at the moment. Everything has the red border on it just so we can see where our different elements are on screen so we get a better idea of how everything is laying out. But in your finished project, we should ask that you would design it and make it more aesthetic and polished in its appearance. Now the camera that we are working with as we're capturing photos is taking something from this uh, web doc off MDN on taking still photos with WebRTC. So I've appropriated some of that. Now we have this other document which talks about capturing an image from the user and it does it in a more progressive manner. And there's some things that are useful about that, but trying to combine this with the uh, fabric Right now, we're not going to worry about creating a mobile version. That will be something that we would work on as we go down the road. Part of what we will experience as you go to make a mobile one is there are video policies for iOS. Now, this says it's new, but it's from 2016, so a few years old. But it still holds true that if you are trying to use a video element, being able to set that video element so that it can play when it's on a mobile device and play meaning it can start capturing a stream is something that we have to take into account if we want the video to play. So this is something else that you may wish to read about in more detail if you decide to work on creating a mobile version. Now, getting the image to be rotated in the camera was simply using a CSS transform as part of it. The video element has its transform property rotate Y set to 180 degrees. So we rotate around the Y or the vertical axis. So if you imagine that the camera is vertical and we are spinning it along its right or left edge, then that flips the camera around 180 degrees or mirrors it. It reverses it so it makes it easier to see what's happening when you're staring at the camera. Looking at the script, we'll see that it's an empty document at the moment and is going to need to get populated with some content. So first thing we're going to do is establish the width. And then I'm going to establish the height. And you'll notice that well, the width has been set to 800, the height has been set to zero. That's because we're going to allow it to be adjusted based on the size of the camera so that it maintains the camera's proportions. And we will do some calculation on that uh, in a little bit. Now, when we're working with the camera object, we're it's a streaming feed that it's providing into the device, so we have to access it and know whether it's streaming or not, otherwise we can't do anything with it. Now, another thing that we're going to do on this project that's a little bit different is we're going to, after these first variables, the next variables, which are going to be related to elements that are on the page itself, we're going to set placeholders for those variables. So I can say video, and I'm gonna set it equal to null, meaning 
the variable exists, but it doesn't have a value yet. And what we're going to do is after all of the elements on the page have loaded, we're going to then call a function, which is then going to populate all of these upcoming variables with values. And the reason that we're doing that is even though in the HTML where we're loading the script at the end, some of the items may not have fully downloaded from the server when we get to this point and we don't want the script to run and try and access something that's not quite loaded into memory yet. So what we're going to do is we're going to populate our variables. We will end up writing a function and we're going to call this startup like that. And we will call startup after the window is listening for an event. The event it's going to be listening for is load and then we will call startup at that time. So this is a pretty common way of working is we use this event listener and we're listening for the load event. The load event means all of the assets on the page have been loaded completely into memory once that's happened. And only after that's happened is startup going to run. Now, if I have a page with tons and tons of content, this is not the best way to do it because it would provide an unsatisfactory experience for the user because they would be stuck wondering if the page is even loading from the server because nothing would show up on screen for a long time. So that would be bad. But as long as we're economical with the assets we're working with, this is a great way and a very common way of doing this. Continuing on our variables. So these are now all reference variables to items that are inside our HTML. So we have our different buttons that we're working with. We have the canvases we're working with. And then we have our images that we are working with. And then I have a few more. It's kind of these are somewhat listed in the order of how they appear on screen. So DB is my download button and then return button will be null. Then we have our two um, main areas. that we're putting on screen. And finally, we have our canvas that we are going to be doing the mixing on and it has a name of, of all things, canvas. So we have a number of different elements that we're working with. These are all going to be referencing all these different IDs that we're doing. Now we're not referencing C, but we're going to have a canvas object that we're going to use with C because Fabric is going to work a little bit different. So canvas is going to refer to the canvas where we will use the Fabric JavaScript library as part of what we are trying to do. Now that I have my primary variables done, I'm going to start working on it. So camera content area will be document. And now if you do use copy paste, it is very important that you do not have any typos in what you are doing. So now I have accessed my camera content area. And I'll 
will grab this one and this will be my canvas mix area. And once I've done that, I'm going to set the class name to display block and then canvas mix area class name will be set equal to display none. And if I save this, back in my web browser that now the mix area is gone and I'm only seeing the uh, camera area, the canvas mix area has disappeared. And there's no errors inside my console, so that is good as well. Now I'm going to store the rest of my elements. And I will use, I'm copy pasting in it to more quickly get through it. So Commander Control, double clicking there, gives me access to both of them so I can just type once. Again, this is one of those, make sure you don't do any typos while you do this, otherwise you are going to uh, have a very unhappy day because now you've misnamed something twice. So misnaming it once is bad, misnaming it a second time is double bad. I'm just going to keep going through. And as I was filling these in, forgot it's start mixing button, not start mixing. So as I type it down here, I need to make sure that it is matching what I'm trying to do. And I don't need these others, so I was over overconfident in my uh, clicking. But now this is where I will make a new fabric. And when we make a new fabric element, the canvas is capitalized. So it's not the lowercase canvas. And then I'm getting the element that has the ID of C. So canvas is expecting it to have an ID on it, not to be a class. Therefore, we only just use the letter C as part of it. And then that matches, if I look over here, the canvas ID of C that I have. So good start as we're working our way through here. So now it's time to start adding in some of the vent listeners that we're going to put on our elements. So inside of Startup, we're going to really be aiming for the low-hanging fruit. So we're going to be starting out first with the different functions that go on, some of the buttons that we're working with, and make that part easy. And then we will go into some of the more complex things. So working with what we already know how to do, we have our photo button. So begin with Start button. Add event listener, we'll be listening for a click. Then my function will be take picture, false. So that gives us the first button that we will be working with there. We have a few more buttons that we'll work with and we'll want to stub out their different functions as well so that we can avoid the errors because if I run this now, it will look for a function called take picture, can't find it, and it will spit out an error message. So I can go over here, I can see take picture is not defined, so we need to define that. Now after the start button, what I'm going to do is work my way through my different parts. So 
now I'm going to have my mixing button after that. So this will be my start mixing button. Add event listener, click. And then this one will be start mixing function. And then I have my download button. And again, same thing, it'll be a click. It'll be my save image function. And then I will have my return button. And once again, it'll be a click. And then this time I will call my return function. And false. So these are the initial clickable items. Now, the other images that I'm working with, my lips, Actually, we can just do it this way. Lips will also call click. And it's going to call the place image function. And then we have beyond lips. I will have my glasses. And finally, I will have the horns. So this gives us now the event listeners for the clickable objects on the screen and takes care of kind of those low hanging fruit. So to prevent us from having issues, now we will just define those out. like this and we're just going to start with a little beautification to clean things up now we do notice that this right here is the end of startup I'm going to put a comment in there to help remember that because we still have more work to do on startup but that now gives me a reminder of what's there might as well do this and take picture so if we get in the habit of doing this, it makes it much easier when we're working with our code and troubleshooting. So this would be my start mixing function. And that. function save image and that and function return and finally function place image and and place image so now I've stubbed it out I can save and see it looks like I may have forgotten one thing let's see what it says over here um, line 44 44 document query is for DB, it says it doesn't know what DB is. And then if I look here, I'll remember that my download button had an ID of download button. It did not have an ID of DB, so I will replace that. And now line 45, looks like I just have some serious uh, 
naming issues here. And closer I will see that uh, I misspelled function under return function because we must always remember to have the fun first when we do it. And now if I look over here, I see there's no more errors. So we're in good shape. So we're making progress here. We've nailed some of the low hanging fruit. We've gone through things that we already know how to do. And now it's time to start digging deeper into things we don't know how to do yet. There is one more event listener that we do need to put in, and this particular one will be on the video element. And this event listener is going to again be a click. And instead of calling a function, we're just going because we just need to do one line. So we will do what's called an anonymous function. So we'll just write and define our function right here. I'll say function, put in my curly brace and say video dot play and then I end my curly brace and comma whoop, video dot oh need my parentheses after play after the curly brace comma and then our ubiquitous false so if I want to put this on multiple lines because that makes you happier while you are trying to read it then you can see so it looks like this. So this is what's called an anonymous function. So instead of referencing a function and defining it as a separate entity or object, here we're just putting it in. Now this allows us for a single command to be able to issue it, but it also means we don't have to then add additional overhead to our project namely creating a function. The more functions or objects that we create, ultimately it's the more memory we're using and that sometimes down the road can be an issue. Now we need this particular item. It's tied to the gesture requirement of working with iOS. So we need to on it have the video applied. Now what it means is the camera can't automatically start playing on any type of touch enabled or gesture based device without input from the user for security reasons. So you can't just have the camera sec secretly recording. So that's why you try and avoid doing that. So we are satisfying our gesture requirement by having click attached to our video element. And that's all it's really doing. So other than that, it's not really doing much else, but that does mean that the camera, once the page is loaded, does start playing and fires up. The very first time you load it on a new computer and browser, it's going to ask for permission because that's what the camera is supposed to do. And every time thereafter, it's no longer going to ask for permission because it assumes that it's already been granted. Now we're going to move into something slightly different. We're going to say navigator media devices get user media and with this we're going to then say video true audio false because all we care about is the visual image. So what we're doing is we're telling the user agent or the web browser to examine the media devices and try and get those media devices. And then what's going to happen is that if that succeeds, then, and really we're using the word then in our programming, we're going to say function, and then we're going to reference the stream that is going to come from the camera. And then with that stream, we will define video, our source object will be equal to stream. And then we tell the video to play. So once it now has access to that stream, or the information from the camera, then it's going to play it. And then we're going to listen for any errors. And if we hear any, 
then we're going to use the function and we're giving it a parameter of error so that we will then use that error and we will say log an error has happened and then we will print out the error. So if there's any problem, if there's a lack of camera, the camera's broken, the user is not permitting the camera, then it's going to show up in the JavaScript console that error message of why the video can't play. Now, a couple of things about this. So we're using get user media and we'll reference some of the documentation in a moment. And we're also using then and catch. So this is a way of writing JavaScript where we're making a promise. So we say, if this first thing is true, then do this. But if it turns out we can't access a media device, then we're going to catch the error. So this is the programming construct that is commonly used for putting this together. Now we could use if else statements or other ways of doing it, but this is the preferred way of going about it. Now, inside of get user media, as we'll see that it returns a promise that resolves the media stream. This is why we're using this method. Another way of writing it under get media is we use the try catch. So we're saying try this thing. If it works, great. Otherwise, give us the error. So when we write it out like this, it's just a little bit easier, I think, to understand it. But we're, we're saying grab the media and then, if we can, use the stream. Otherwise, tell us what the error is. So we can read about it and read a little bit about working with promises inside of JavaScript and see how they work. So promises are a way of working with JavaScript so that we are trying to catch errors as part of what we're doing. So that we say, try this, and it, it works, then do this. Otherwise, we've caught the error, so it doesn't just crash our program, and then we do something with the error. So using some type of error detection and working with it is a better way of working. Now, some of this may look a little bit scary when you look at the code, and the nice part is we can generally find such as examples like this where someone has written out the logic of what we need. We will notice under promises that we will sometimes see this nomenclature here where we see parentheses equal sign and uh, greater than sign or the uh, right caret or angle bracket. And what that is is that is called an arrow function and it's part of ES6, the newest uh, syntax that we're using for JavaScript. And we have a link in the links document that goes into arrow functions in much greater detail. So you can read about those during your spare time if you want to get more information about them. But in essence, what happens with an arrow function is it's just a shorthand way of writing functions. And it's not that far off of what we have grown used to if we're using jQuery where we say dot and do something, dot do something, dot do something. So we're writing it out in this method dot click and then say function event and do these things. Well, we can start to write it with a much more efficient structure using arrow function. So we can say where we look here where we're using the reduce method and then we have this anonymous function AB that returns A and B. In ES6, we can say reduce AB arrow A, B, or zero. So what we can do is realize that arrow functions are just a quicker or more succinct way of writing things, and they're growing in popularity. Back in the JavaScript now, we're going to add some more onto it. So the navigator get user media allows us to establish that stream that we are working with here and to find out can we even get it and either create that stream or it's going to give us an error message. And it seems that I typed function wrong there. I forgot the n. Apparently I'm just having no fun with my functions here. And if I go back over here, I will see that 
I am now getting a video stream into my video. I can click take a picture all I want, but nothing is going to happen just yet. So we're making progress. We have the video, the video is playing, we have that stream occurring, and now we want to establish a few things about the size of the video. Next segment, we're going to tell the video to listen for the event can play. And we'll call the anonymous function, and I must remember my fun function. And now as we work with this element, I'm going to start out and say if we're not streaming, meaning video is not running yet. I'm going to set our height equal to the video video height and we'll divide that by a ratio and the ratio we're going to use is video video width divided by width. Now if you remember Initially, we set width in our top values, but we didn't give height a value. So going back up top, width had a value, height does not have a value. So we set those values initially. We set width. Video width and video height, it's retrieving from the video object. So it's retrieving that, and then it will set the height proportional to that. Now we do need to um, take into account there may... Uh, Firefox may have an issue and if height is not a number meaning it can't resolve that value from the camera then what we're going to say is height is going to be equal to our width value that we established up at the beginning and we will divide that by the ratio of 4 divided by 3 because 4 divided by 3 is the typical proportion for most webcam style cameras. So it's not a panoramic, it's not a widescreen, but most are in that uh, 4 by 3 ratio, 4 being the width, 3 being the height. Now we can see that we're doing a similar kind of relationship here where we're establishing height and this is now working on using proportional sizing. So we know that if we have the video height divided by height, that is going to be same, give us the same value as video width divided by width. So to uh, figure out what this height is, we're using just a little bit of math. So if we had video height and we divide that by our height then we know that should give us the same proportional value as our video width divided by width. So to figure out what H is then what we're able to do is because H is on the bottom over there and um, this is on the side over here to solve for H so this is doing a little bit of math then we have our VH divided by and now we move we'll just move this whole thing over here VW divided by W is going to be equal to and then so if we divide by something on one side that means if we multiply both sides by that same amount then the H over the H on the left will be the same it will give me our H that we have over here we just have to flip flop it to match this order here but we did that by saying VH divided by H 
Well, if we also then multiply it by h, and this would be easier to write out if I was doing it vertically, not all in just one line. So if we multiply both sides here by h, and then we know that vw divided by w times h, we know that this equation is still true. Well, now if we have this side, vh divided by h times h, the h's cancel each other out, so this is now just going to be vh on this side over here. So that now means that this is just vh. And we can say, see how vh, and now we can then, um, but we're solving for h, so now we multiply, divide both sides by this amount. So because we know this is this item times this, so now if we divide this whole side by vw divided by w, and then this side divided by vw, and on this side they cancel out, now we end up with this, or h is equal to, which is what we have right here. So that's the ratio factor that we're working with, is we're trying to come up with a proportional sizing. If you want to have it make more sense in your brain, if that didn't, because I don't think that was the most clear explanation, use real numbers, plug some in, and see how it works. So you're working on scale factors. We're trying to keep things proportional. But once we have our values for it, then what we want to do, once we know that, is we now need to start assigning it. So we'll set the video, and we'll set our attribute. And we would do with, and we're going to set it equal to the width value that we have established, then video height, and we'll set it to our height. And then we're also going to set the canvas photo. We'll set its attribute of width. And then set its attribute of height as well. We will then set streaming equal to true. And because this is part of an event listener, we don't want it to bubble, we'll set the false as well. So now the can play listener has been set as part of it. Finally, what we want to do is we want to then populate our um, photo area, so going back into the HTML, if I look in the HTML, so I have the canvas, we're never going to actually see the canvas here, but what we do want to do is we want to set this image's content with something so that it's clear, because every time we come back to this camera, we want it to be an empty screen so we can take a new picture. So to do that, we are then going to have to access that canvas element, and then we will have to populate that canvas element. So to do that process, we are going to call a function 
and it will be titled clear photo. So clear photo is a function that we will use a couple times so that's why we are not just doing the process right there but are going to separate it out. So we call clear photo and clear photo. Now what clear photo is going to do is we're going to grab the context of our canvas photo and that context is going to be 2D. Now that we have the context, we'll set our fill style equal to, in this case I'll choose a color, the color I'm going to choose is something bright and obnoxious, I encourage you to choose something that makes you happy. It doesn't really matter what color you choose. And now we're going to fill it from the top left corner. to the bottom right corner. So then we go X, Y, width, and then height. So if we look again, we don't see anything. And we do have, oh, did I write context? single context because, well, we're now filling up that canvas photo with pink. We want to then copy its data so we'll grab the con canvas photo and we are going to write the canvas's data to an image and it will be of type PNG. And now photo. So if we look up here, we have photo. And if we look in the HTML, we can see we have photo. This is that image we're working with. And we're going to then set the photo set attribute. The attribute we're setting is source. And we will populate that source with the data that we have generated. If I save, there's no error message. I go here and I can see there's pink. But take photo doesn't do anything yet because we have not got to that point. To end this first portion of working with this, what we're going to do is take the picture. Once we have the picture, then we will see how that looks. So we'll grab the canvas uh, the context again and once we have it so we will ask you know if so we're asking you know before we take the picture we're trying to find out if there is within height values. Because if height has not been defined yet, if it's not resolved, then we know um, we need to do something else. So if width and height it exist, we're going to say canvas photo with equals width width and height and then we'll tell the context to draw image and then we're specifying what image we're drawing now, if you are wondering how to figure out what these different things 
mean, what you have to do is you have to go through the documentation. So you have to look up in the references. So you will look up the Canvas API. You'll look up drawing images to it and how that works. You can, now you'll notice that this is similar to what we worked with on uh, clear photo. So there are a lot of similarities here and we probably could um, work on doing some refactoring. But right now, we will say this works. So we're using a similar process. We use a similar process when we download as well, where we convert the image into the two data URL, turn it into a PNG so that we can download the file, which we will look at later. So we definitely can see how if we're working with this here where the data is going to be the same and this is the same, we probably could consolidate that into a single function and just call it. So if we're missing height and width, then we clear the photo so that it now writes it um, with the giant pink square. So now, saving this, we can see, I'm seeing that there is one error message over here. So 103, go down to line 103, and let's see what we have going on. At line 103, it seems that I missed a comma when I was typing. Now I save, no more error messages, webcam shows up, take a picture, there it is. So it works. We've now achieved the first start or first stage of a project, which is using the webcam to take a picture. The next stage that we are going to work with will be to then incorporate fabric and create our mixable collage with downloadable pictures.